<clears throat> I'm working on the subject of aquaculture, supply chain change with David Zilberman and with others. And I want to focus in on the case of Asia, but I'm going to start actually with uh, the view of how the fish sector and the fish supply chain has uh, grown over time and evolved in US and Europe and how that in a sense, in, a, in the sense of dominoes falling, has heavily influenced the rise of aquaculture in Asia uh, because it's been a demand side driver in terms of huge levels of imports of fish and seafood coming from Asia into the, Euro into the European and the US market. And then secondly, I'll talk about <clears throat> demand side drivers in Asia itself with the rapid income increase in urbanization that's occurring there, which has driven up very quickly and very recently the demand for fish. And third, I'll talk about then supply side transformation of Asian fish supply chains. And finally, a few implications for the global bioeconomy. I, I like to start some of these talks and visions uh, with the historical roots. And I think that the story of cod is extremely important to the evolution of fish demand and supply in Europe and then the US. And what happened with the demise of cod fishing was extremely important as an inducement to aquaculture rise in Asia. If we think about uh, essentially, usually I walk around, it's difficult to stand in one place. Hey, you can pick up that mic and, and carry it around. But it's, I'm, I think I'm, I'm, I'm linked up. I can walk, okay. So basically, yeah, I usually, you know, can't, I'm not, you know, can't stand like this. But basically, if you think about a product cycle, a product cycle uh, starts from a local niche, okay? So for example, cod in Norway and not consumed in the rest of Europe and not consumed in the US, it's a local niche product. And then there was a commoditization of the product where it becomes a bulk a bulk, voluminously traded product, a commodity without a lot of product differentiation. And then the third stage is often some kind of product differentiation, for example, organic or other kinds of uh, differentiation of the variety. So if we think about a, a fish that was very plentiful uh, in Northern Europe back, let's say, uh, almost a thousand years ago, we saw a situation where trade, and if you look at um, Madison's work, the incomes of Europe started to rise with the Hanseatic League, which started in Lübeck, Germany, and then they essentially went to buy fish from Lofoten in Norway and dried cod through Bergen and then traded it to the rest of Europe. As pressure uh, went on that demand side, then they moved to sourcing from Iceland. So from about 1200 to 1400 to 1500, you had this tremendous increase of the fish supply chain from Northern Europe and essentially feeding Europe, not yet feeding other places in the world. And um, it then Spain and Holland took up the baton and commoditized cod trade from the 1500s to 1600s. It went from an extremely valuable product. If you had one boat the size of this room full of cod, it would be enough to buy a country essentially at that time, or by an army, certainly, which then, if you have an army, then you have a country, right? <laughs> and so essentially it was extremely expensive and then, then the price was driven down tremendously over three or 400 years as incomes were generated. Then essentially there was a competition to try to get cheaper and cheaper sources of cod, so they went to a place called North America. And in fact, uh, if you look at the history, the history of North America really was driven mainly by the search for cod sources, okay? Then if you, if you think about it, um, the colonies were actually founded on the cod uh, economy as a new source of production for the European market. Cape Cod, okay? Cape Cod and over the, the Massachusetts government building, there's a cod because it was the entire driving of the economy was based on searching for this cod, bioeconomy. There's the Cape Cod, there's the cod, <laughs> okay? So there was a vast increase on the supply side in cod fishing coming from the Northern Atlantic and being dried and then sent to the US market and to the European market in the 1800s. And during the 1800s then you had a lot of technological 
innovation in uh, trawling boats that could then capture a lot more cod, go deeper and go further until you had a, a really, really cheap source of uh, protein consumption for the European and US market. Then fascinatingly, and this is often something as David is emphasizing, not thought about very much, uh, what, what's happening on the demand side that further drove the fish industry and cod fishing. Really, there was a gigantic diffusion of consumption of demand of cod in Europe and the US, driven first by a big shock to food technology. And I usually have pictures of this, but there was an invention of a plate froster which took essentially something that looks like a french fry, and that's why the french fry looks like a french fry, because it takes a rectangular bit of the product and then sends it to something like you'd see in Burger King, you know, where, but it freezes it as it moves through, and then it happens to look like a french fry, okay? Or a fish stick, or, or a chicken McNugget, because that was the original technology. Suddenly, instead of drying the product, which is really, you know, not very appealing, you could freeze the product in mass amounts and then in the 1960s, the guy that did the Kentucky Fried Chicken thought if you take a pressure cooker and, and put oil in it and work with it a little bit, you can then get a technology where you can take frozen chicken or fish and then, uh, and then put it into uh, the, the pressure cooker and then quickly produce French fries, fish sticks, egg, you know, egg McMuffins, all these kinds of things uh, very quickly. And that increased vastly the consumption of uh, fish, but now moving in form from dried fish to frozen fish sticks that could be shipped a long distance. This then reduced the time for fish preparation in restaurants. It created a mass market, which really became the basis of our fast food culture through those two inventions. And fish and, of course, chicken were key parts of it. And you see this in Europe and US, but also now you see the diffusion of this in Beijing, as I'll point out in a second. So here's fish sticks or fingers in 1960s. Uh, here's the McDonald's filet of fish in the 1960s. These are the basic drivers that changed our consumption habits. But of course, it also changed our stock of fish, right? It was brought up yesterday in the talk about duckweed. I went out and had a massive dinner of duckweed. I, I sat and digested it, <laughs> just like a, a huge Irish American biorefinery all, all night, okay? <laughs> okay, so basically, there was this, uh, from the 1970s to now, you overfished the cod in all these areas, and it came to a point where now the United States imports 90% of its fish and seafood needs, okay, 90%. And where is it coming from? It's coming from Asia mainly, okay, also a few other places. And 50% of what it gets from Asia is from aquaculture. Aquaculture invented by the Chinese four or 5,000 years ago, along with everything else, right, basically, uh, suddenly, you know, was just a niche thing for royalty, okay, and maybe a little bit of coastal production. But over the past 10 years, or 15 years, that's why all of these processes are very, very rapid. They're not slow and gradual. Most of the things I'm studying are just like explosions, right? It's a confluence of things come together and then shove the thing off. This rose extremely quickly in about 15 years, the uh, Asian aquaculture. And there was um, the massive demand side pull of imports from the US and Europe pushed it to start it, and then the ball rolled faster with urbanization and demand in Asia itself. Okay, so you, you basically have a shift on the US side from eating cod and oysters to eating tilapia, which is uh, from the Nile, right? And then was introduced to the rest of the world. Catfish from Vietnam, Vaname shrimp that came from Latin America through the US over to Asia. And this becomes a key part of our food now, okay? Uh, salmon, and of course, uh, salmon then coming from Chile aquaculture, which was Norwegians introducing salmon into Chile, right? And then you have tuna uh, and pollock from Asia, which are the main capture products still. But as was pointed out yesterday, the tuna catch is going down quickly with overfishing, and the pollock is a slow-growing cod that is, you know, you fish it out and then that's it, right? So basically we've had a tremendous shift in species in just a few years. Why? Okay, let's take a look. And on the road to taking a look at the supply side, 
Let's think for a second about the demand side of, 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 of Asia uh, on the fish side. First big driver, just as it was in the US, is urbanization, going from 18% in Asia to 44% to 56%. Um, the share of population in cities over total population understates the share of the cities in the market for different products, simply because incomes are different. So in fact, two-thirds to three-quarters of Asian fish goes to Asian cities. Okay, another 10% goes to export, and then the rest goes to rural areas. So this is urban-driven change. And if you look already about um, uh, 50 uh, to 65% of the spending, the, the spending level of rice is equal to the spending level of fish. So fish is trending toward equality with the basic grain expenditure in Asia from very low share 20 years ago. These are not gradual processes. These are sudden processes. And fish in Beijing has gone up eight times over about a decade. It was not a traditional fish. People there, even the professors that I work with there, thought fish is coming from local catch and being sent over here. But in fact, it's coming from long supply chains of frozen fish from Guangdong and Shandong up to uh, Beijing. So the same processes that occurred in Europe and the US are very quickly occurring, but only over a very short time. That's what I found in my work on transformation of supply chains. The things almost all the things that I'm seeing in emerging markets like Asia and Latin America happened exactly the same in the US, but over four to five times longer period in the US. So it's more of an explosive change in these places. Of course, with such a demand side earthquake, you're bound to see supply chain changes in aquaculture. <clears throat> Basically, what you've seen is a shift from capture to aquaculture. Traditionally, of course, Asians brought, uh, got fish from oceans and lakes and streams. Now this is greatly reduced due to pollution, overfishing, and urbanization. Secondly, traditionally, uh, Asians got fish by semi-capture, that is raising fish in rice fields. There's still a lot of people doing work on that. There's always a huge lag in research from between reality and what's happening now. So people are still working and burrowing away on fish in rice ponds. It doesn't exist almost at all anymore, according to our research. So now uh, it's basically, of course, due to the intensification of rice. And then also, and it goes from um, a traditional but niche aquaculture practice in places like ancient China and a little bit along coast to now massification of aquaculture around Asia. Extremely fast, sudden. And there's also a product cycle innovation. Very interesting. This goes to your bioeconomy. You go from a local niche products, which are basically carp, and tiger shrimp, which I'll show you in a second, to the big three commodity species that now we eat in the US and is, are eaten all over Asia. Almost none of them from the places that they started in, right? Just like apples are from Kyrgyzstan, and yet we think of them as a basic American product now. It, the, the basic idea, just as we've been talking about in this bio conference, is shifting from slow growth farming to high velocity, what uh, David Zilberman calls is biofactories, right? So you're shifting toward products and species and technologies that allow you to produce almost like a biofactory. Here's a little biofactory, a uh, cute little one. Uh, uh, traditional, you wouldn't want to be swimming that way, of course, uh, <laughs> but it's a traditional Asian carp, slow growing, low density, okay? Uh, and then you have its competitor, which is displacing it, is Asian tilapia, which is actually an African fish. It's a local fish. When I work in Tanzania, they say, oh, that's our local trout from originally when my grandfather, it was just our local product now around the world, introduced because it's super fast grower. They also have a mono sex thing. And, um, uh, and also, uh, I don't know about bathrooms for monosex tilapia, but, and then, <laughs> and then you have, it can grow in extremely high density, okay? Another uh, competitor with carp that's displacing it and being introduced very quickly is, some people thought that's a picture of me, that's not me, okay? Yeah. Uh, basically, uh, many bald people look alike, you know? So, <laughs> just like, uh, you know, bags at the airport, right? So. Uh, so basically, Asian pangasius, which is catfish, very fast grower. And the cute, good thing about this guy is that, you know, 
it breathes air. It goes up and it gasps for air like dolphins and then it goes down. So you can put a lot of these in a given pond. So again, tilapia can be dense. Catfish can be dense, very different from carp. And then also tiger shrimp, which was the traditional shrimp, uh, is sort of a bottom feeder like a lot of my undergraduates. Okay, and uh, actually, if you see these, these shrimp, they can become bigger than lobster, you know, as they grow. Uh, but they're bottom feeders, right? They don't grow volumetrically, so you can't produce them densely. They're being shoved out and replaced with vaname from Latin America through U.S. there, also because there was a lot of diseases with monodon. And so they can produce volumetrically in massive amounts and floating up in the water, okay? So if you have a lot of... If you shift to species that are produced densely, then you need to have aeration, right? You need oxygen for these guys, okay? And so, um, basically, there's been a lot of investment in Asia in a very short time with remittances and non-farm income into, you know, put into the investments for something that pays 10 times more than raising rice. You grow rice and you earn 10 times more if you convert the rice into a fish pond. Okay, and so they're putting aeration and water circulation to allow this kind of dense stocking. Here's the aerators of a local yokel guy that introduced it. Here's pump investment to move the water around. And here's the biggest shrimp operation in the world in Indonesia with massive aerators to produce this. If you had shrimp this week and it's the number one fish and seafood product in the United States, so you probably had it, you might have had it from this pond. Okay, now of course, then, kind of tying back into you guys, because you're all saying, where's the duckweed? You know, where is the, where's the feed, the feed angle on this? I'm come to it, okay? There's basically a massive increase in very rapid and very recently in feed use, concentrated feed use. This is a Zilberman biofactory. Traditionally, you just let fish capture insects and natural zooplankton, okay? They, if you can still see this in some traditional ponds, they just allow them to, to live as they would. Then semi-traditional, you start putting manure and fertilizer into the water so that you get phytoplankton. And then from the phytoplankton, the zooplankton come and feed on the phytoplankton. The fish come and feed on the zooplankton. Then uh, we feed on the fish. And we don't know yet who feeds on us. Okay. Then modern, you have first sinking feed, then floating feed, pelletized feed. Uh, that allows you to not have a lot of muck in the water and disease. And then you get a lot more uh, density and, uh, and yields. So you have a rise of value chain financing. This is going back to David's point. You introduce an, an innovation, and then the feed mills have to make it attractive for farmers to be able to get it. They don't have their own credit to get it. They also feel it's risky to adopt this new technology, so they have value chain financing that induces the farmers to take it up, exactly as Land O'Lakes did with farmers in the Midwest in the 1920s, 1930s. Same idea, new, it, new invention, and then um, you need to be helped uh, to, to go for it. And of course, then there's a rapid rise of fish feed supply chain in Asia. Traditionally, it was just local feed assemblage. Okay, two minutes. Um, and then you start to have a bunch of, you know, peppering of small and medium enterprises producing feed. And now you have um, a very recently and very intensively invested in cl clusters of large-scale mills. If you think about Bangladesh, Dhaka, around Dhaka, you had peri-urban a development of chicken and chicken feed and industries that went in and invested in that very, very quickly in a short time. And then those industries saw fishes coming up, so they invested in lines of fish feed, right? So these clusters tend to be concentrated, consolidated, spatially uh, located, okay? And then that fish industry that we're talking about in Asia and also the feed industry is starting to have restructuring and consolidation in the same way that you see in the seed industries that you've been talking about, the early starters are investing in late starters, right, as you, as you always see. There's foreign direct investment in fish feed operations coming from China, like New Hope, a big operation, and Thailand, uh, Chatham Popcon, in investing f into feed operations in Indonesia and Bangladesh. So you have that kind of intra-regional spilling over of effects. You also have a lot of foreign direct investment now in aquaculture itself, which is relatively new, but then you know, suddenly changes the technology um, within the areas where there's investment. And of course you have, because of these, emerging consolidation and feed and aquaculture sectors. 
um, to conclude, you like that, right? Or almost to conclude, is that you find also vertically integrated operations <laughs> And they're vertically integrated in order to have supply chain control. This is going back to what David talked about, about you know, controlling your feedstock and controlling your, supply, your, your wholesale in order to meet private standards and certification demands by European and U.S. Uh, buyers and to meet contracts with big uh, buyers such as Walmart or Cisco. So what are the implications for the global bioeconomy? This is, in fact, the last slide. Um, there's obviously the most exciting thing from the point of view of, of U.S. exporters is that there's a big demand for maize, soy, and peanut cake and fish meal that um, is being induced by this sudden shift and everybody's looking at it. Secondly, you, have a, a, if you could have, although I haven't seen it yet, but it's possible given the talk yesterday, an increase in demand for alternative feeds such as duckweed. Third. There's an increase in demand for energy in farming from aquaculture because it's very energy intense compared to the traditional and it's a sudden surge in the need for that. And finally, this is something that David likes to talk about, is will there really be a reshoring of fish production with induced aquaculture in the United States? Okay, because there'll be eventually competition for resources in the areas because of these three things in Asia. And the question is with, um, with automation and other kinds of, um, of uh, innovations, perhaps there could be a lot of production, especially of the more valuable fish species and seafood species, seafood species um, in North America uh, as, as a source of, uh, of uh, local protein. Thank you very much. Thank you.